Did you know that both Pablo Escobar and Joaquin El Chapo Guzman are collectively worth over $50 billion? There are numerous points of comparisons between the drug lords Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria and Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, and I mean beyond their finely trimmed mustaches. Both were narco-terrorists who led extremely dangerous cartels in their respective countries. Beyond the drug smuggling, both of them were incredibly rich, enough to be profiled in Forbes on multiple occasions. Since the late 1970s, two men have emerged as the most powerful and most dangerous drug lords history has ever come across. As they climbed to the top, Escobar and Guzman garnered incredible amounts of wealth and showed the world an equally appalling degree of horror. But while they both dealt in drugs, they worked in quite different markets and under slightly different circumstances. They faced different competitions and supplied different markets. El Chapo's Sinaloa cartel smuggled marijuana, ecstasy, heroin, and crystal methamphetamine. Escobar's Medellin cartel, on the other hand, specialized predominantly in cocaine. He is responsible for whatever cocaine trade is in Colombia today. Their operations overlapped for only four years. Escobar was shot in 1993, and the Sinaloa cartel was founded in 1989. But the question of who between these two drug kingpins was most powerful is an interesting one to answer. And that is what the video will set out to do today. Pablo was born into a poor farming family near Medellin in northern Colombia. Escobar started his career with petty crime and he smuggled electronic sets in the beginning. But soon he realized the profits and drugs and steadily migrated to, at first, smuggling and eventually carting shipments of marijuana. By the end of the 1970s, Escobar already and various associates of his began trafficking cocaine out of Colombia. The country has never remained the same since then. By the early 80s, the Pablo Escobar-led Medellin cartel was shipping an immense amount of cocaine to an insatiable U.S. market. At some point, even Guzman helped him smuggle cocaine. And because he didn't particularly save his money in the bank, it is quite hard to estimate Escobar's wealth. But here are some fair postulations. It is believed that Escobar made an average of $420 million in a week by the mid-80s, which translates to roughly $22 billion in a year. By the end of the decade, Escobar was supplying 80% of the world's cocaine, and he was smuggling an average of 15 tons of that supply into the United States every day. Escobar frequently appeared on the Forbes billionaire list. Between 1987 and 1993, when he was shot dead, Forbes featured Escobar on its list annually. Escobar was worth $3 billion in 1987. Estimates place Escobar's total worth to around $30 billion. He spent $2,500 a month on rubber bands just to hold his cash, and he once offered to pay off Colombia's $10 billion debt. Escobar bought apartments, bought a zoo, and bought a football club. These acts endeared him to the locals of Medellin. His brother, Roberto, wrote in his 2009 book that Pablo was earning so much that each year we would write off 10% of that money because the rats would eat it in storage or it would be damaged by water or lost. It was inevitable that Escobar, making all that money illegally and flaunting it, would attract attention. The Colombian government soon began to clash with him and also fellow drug traffickers came at him. The war against Pablo would go on for years with the United States government joining in. It would unleash unspeakable violence within Colombia. He organized the Palace of Justice siege in 1985 to destroy evidence against him, but the climax would be Pablo organizing the bombing of the Avianca Flight 203 in 1989. 111 people died on the plane. In the same year, Pablo Escobar had the Colombian presidential candidate, Luis Carlos Galán, assassinated. These deeds don't include that countless other government officials, judges, journalists, media personalities, and an unbelievable amount of police officers, regardless of their rank. The whole nation of Colombia was at the mercy of Pablo Escobar. By mid-1991, the government cracked down on Pablo, forced him to negotiate a deal. Basically, he agreed to go to prison, but only on the condition that he would be allowed to build his own. The government agreed. Pablo built his prison with clubs, a football field, a standard gym, and a lounge. It was a charade. And to add insult to injury, Pablo Escobar was still running his drug empire from prison. By 1992, the Colombian government decided to move him to a government-owned prison, but Pablo escaped. He reunited with his family and went on the run. At one point, while on the run, Escobar burned a stash of $2 million to keep his daughter warm. 
He would remain on the run until December 2, 1993, when Colombian security forces caught up with him in a hideout. He tried to escape, but they caught up with him and shot him on a rooftop in Medellin. Guzman's Like Escobar's is a proper rags-to-riches story. The cartel he would famously be associated with, the Sinaloa, had been in existence before he emerged, but the cartel would only reach its present global standing under his guidance. Guzman was undoubtedly the drug baron of all of Mexico. He oversaw marijuana and poppy cultivation throughout Mexico and drew on South American suppliers to cater for U.S., Europe, and Asian markets. It has been reported that, at its peak, the cartel had a presence in 24 of Mexico's 32 states and in as many as 50 countries, including an extensive network in the United States. At some point, the cartel controlled 35% of the cocaine produced in Colombia and, according to Drug Enforcement Administration, supplied 80% of the heroin, cocaine, marijuana, and meth flowing into the Chicago region each year. It is also believed that the cartel had influences in Australia, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. The cartel has also popped up in West and North Africa. As one drug lord's story ended in Colombia in 1993, another took a dramatic turn in Mexico. A rival gang in Mexico attempted to assassinate Guzman in Guadalajara in 1993, but they failed, and instead they murdered a Catholic cardinal. This caused a massive backlash from the government and the people. It caused Guzman to flee to Guatemala, but he was soon caught and locked up in a Mexican prison. This would be the first of Guzman's audacious prison escapes. In 2001, he escaped the Mexican prison by apparently hiding himself in a laundry cart. It has been purported that several top-ranking security personnel in the prison also helped him. This further forged the legend that he has strong ties to top-ranking government officials. In prison, Guzman had eased his way with bribes. He had women visit him regularly, and he still ran his cartel. Upon his escape, Guzman spent 13 years on the run. He was caught again in Mazatlan, Mexico, in February 2014. He was locked up again and yet again, you guessed right, he escaped extravagantly. This time the plan was elaborate. Guzman's henchmen had dug a tunnel from a property they had purchased about a mile from the prison, and they dug all the way to Guzman's prison cell. He would spend six months on the run this time around before being recaptured in January 2016 in Los Mokis, a city in Sinaloa. Shortly after another transfer fueled by fears of the possibility of another prison break, he was extradited to the United States in late 2016. He is currently in one of the deadliest prisons in the United States, the Administrative Maximum Facility in Florence, Colorado. He remains there until today. Before we give our verdict, kindly like and subscribe to the channel. It is quite obvious that while Guzman is the more flamboyant escapist, Pablo Escobar had the most power between both notorious drug dealers. Escobar held a nation at hostage at the height of his power and daringly committed some ghastly acts to hold that leverage over his country. Escobar even ran for a political position in his own country. Guzman, on the other hand, spent a majority of his career on the run. While he had considerable wealth, he wasn't as rich as Escobar who offered to clear a whole country's national debt. And there we have it. Which drug lord do you think was the most powerful? Let us know in the comments section below.